He didn't destroy Moses. But he, he said to Moses, I have a law. Even you have to live by it, Moses. You can't disobey my commandment. Um, I said to you to do it, and you didn't do that. Um, so I have to use you as an example uh, because I want the people to know that I don't... Listen, God destroyed the Israelites by the thousands. He opened up the earth. In one day, three and 20,000 of them were destroyed. The wrath of God. You know, look, at, uh, look at this. Um, if I could get it, Corinthians. I hope I get it real quickly here. Uh, where he put the four neithers. Neither, 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 neither. Uh, get back over here to it. And um, he did commit fornication as they did. And um, so on. Is that Corinthians? Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, Corinthians 4. It might be Corinthians 4. What is it? 10 and 8. 10 and 8. Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 10 and 8. Okay, let's get that. See if that be it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, that's it. Thank you, Tom. 1 uh, Corinthians 10 and uh, 5. Let's take 5. 1 uh, Corinthians 10, and uh, we could take 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock. See, for the thing, that spiritual rock. Uh, that Christ was that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Yeah. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our example, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also uh, lusted. Neither be you idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication. There's four neithers there. As some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. For what? Committing fornication. Committing fornication. Three and twenty thousand in one day. And then, neither, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither mummer ye, as some of them also mummer and were destroyed of the destroyer. Yeah. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they were written for our admonition, from whom the end of the world, that's the Jewish world, are come. The ends of the Jewish world. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted of a, that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That took me a long time to fully believe that scripture. There is no temptation taken you which is not common to man, but with will, that part of it, will, with every temptation, make a way of escape. But he said he would. He said he would. So it must be us not looking for the way out. <laughs> it must be us. <laughs> it's not God. He said he would make a way. You got to believe God. You can't doubt God. No, sir. You know, you can't doubt God. If you start doubting God, you're in trouble. Uh, but he said he will with every temptation. So it must be us, not God. We're not looking for the gate open. We're not looking for the door open. That's what you used to teach us. Pardon me? That's what you used to teach us. I taught you that, didn't I? I said the animal paces back and forth in the cage line. And all he's looking for is one time that door be cracked. He never gives up. That wild nature in him is walking back and forth. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. He's the way he's going to get out. Well, I think as Christians, we just always look for the way out. What is the way out? Uh, this temptation is coming in on me, but what is the way out of it, Lord? 
uh, for the way out. <laughs> no, if you don't think that doesn't deal with discipleship, you'd better get into that, yeah. Sister Ginger. I was thinking of the scripture that we spoke of the other day, uh, man ought always to pray and not to faint. And, and But what came to me first was that skit last night, how they had to persevere. Right, right, they had to persevere. That skit was so dramatic last night, the young people. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And they, they made it so realistic. But it's exactly true. You know, Haley played the part of the young woman who was converted to Christ. And then here come the different temptations, and it was tempting her with the drink, with the um, money, and, and with the flirtatious uh, woman uh, of the world, uh, and, and uh, finally caused her to succumb and gave in. And Christians sometimes will do that. But then Christ does not forget us. He knows who we are. He knows where we are. And he, as Andy played that part, you know, he came in and finally withstood them and, and threw them back. Well, you know, that's that's what happens with Jesus if we look for the way to escape. Yes. If we look yes. for that way to get out, he'll make it. Sooner or later, we'll get out of it, you know. Uh, when I hear Andy. those things, I always think this one line comes to me all the time, in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, yes. That always comes to me about yes. those things. When it's yes. time, it'll happen. Yes, in the fullness of time, yes. uh, you know, uh, and, and then t pair that with Ecclesiastes 3. And, and that absolutely should teach us uh, a great deal. Ecclesiastes, uh, the third chapter, uh, that, that really will help our minds I mean, when we're studying temptation and things were going through and, and God and things were being uh, put under them to everything, to everything. And that's hard to believe too, isn't it? That's hard to accept. But he said to everything, without exception, to everything, there is a season and a time and every purpose doesn't matter what it is, there's a season, there's a time. Hold out, hold on, endure. Endure hardness as a good soldier, Paul said. How long do you endure? As long as it takes. How long is that endurance? As long as it takes. He that endureth unto the end. How long is that? To the end. You know, just endure to the end. Brother Roberts, my pastor, he, he was a bridge builder. And he said one time, uh, he was up over the Mississippi River building the bridge between Cairo, Illinois, and, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, bridge that crosses where the Ohio and the Mississippi come together. And there was a fellow with him, and they had a big steel beam up there. And the beam was down, the crane operator dropped it down where it was uh, on Brother Robert's arm. And he, he was way above the river, 200 feet above the river that bridge span, and uh, if, he, if he would have let go, his body would have fell off that beam from the pain, the suffering, that heavy steel beam was right down on his arm. And uh, he was lying prone on the beam, and this fellow couldn't help him, he couldn't lift the beam, and he was trying to get the crane operator to lift it, it off of him. And he said to Brother Roberts, he said, he said you were a Christian, Let's see how long you stand that. Let's see how long you stand that. And uh, Brother Robert said, well, I'll tell you now, I'll be a Christian when the Mississippi turns to rust. <laughs> when the Mississippi turns to rust, I'll be a Christian. And he held. And finally the crane operator got it off his arm and they were able to get him down, you know. Uh, but he had a lot of wonderful experiences in the yeah. building the Saint, bridge across the St. John's River just before he came here to pastor the church. God showed him the vision to come to Bradenton. Never been here before. Never been in the city. God showed him the house he was to live in. Showed him the street the church was to be on. he never been here. Uh, but um, he was up on that bridge and he started a grocery store and he was in a donut shop and 
had business in Jacksonville, but Roberts was a very industrious man and a creator of businesses. And he, he didn't want to leave Jacksonville, making big money building that bridge. And uh, one day a big steel beam came down on his leg and smashed his feet, smashed his right foot, and the bones were sticking out from the flesh, just fragmented the whole foot. And uh, they got him down, and he, the Lord said, now will you go? Now will you do what I've asked you to do? Or will you go back on that bridge? And Brother Robert said, I'll never go back on that bridge as long as I live. I never will. I'm going to do what God told me to do. And he called Brother Souders. Brother Souders said, Brother Roberts, you better obey the Lord and go to that city of Raymond that you've never been. And uh, he came and he said, when he made that commitment in the hospital, they said, we have to amputate your foot. We have to take your foot off up to the uh, knee, below, just below the knee. And Brother Robert said, no, wrap my foot up. Wrap my foot up, I'm going home. They wrapped his foot up, put a big bandage on it. They said, you're taking your life in your hands. He said, no. I serve a God that spoke to me. I've got this because of disobedience, and God will heal me. He went home. The second day he was home in terrible pain, he heard a snapping and a popping and a moving, and the bones began to come back together in his foot. Come back together. They never tested with a knife, they never tested with a surgeon, and his bone, and he walked and had good, strong feet, and God healed him, brought the skin back together, put the bones back in place. There is a mighty God. There is a mighty God. He is a mighty God. He is a mighty God. We just need to get that back in the church. We need to get that faith back in the church. Oh God, there is a mighty God. Almighty God. These are not taken out of somebody's fantasy book. The book of Deuteronomy is not a fantasy book. This is not a fantasy book. It's real. See, God could not make known his ways to the children of Israel. He made known his acts. Yes. But to some of them, he made known his ways, the leadership. Yes. And I have a feeling right now, I really do, the devil can't stop it. It's not time for the enemy to triumph. Yes. It's time for us to believe yes. that God is going to change every situation. Yes. <laughs> he will do it. Don't doubt it. Let's believe that that God is going to change the situation of the church. He's not going to let it stay like it is. You know why he's not going to let it stay like it is? Because it's not right yet. If Jesus would come tonight, the church would not be in order, would not be ready. It must get ready. It must be prepared. There must be a ministry teach the Word. There must be a people living. There must be people have faith. Must be people that believe God. So, you know, these are these are real experience. I just want to know his ways. I mean, that is acts rather. I, I that's wonderful that happened to Brother Roberts. Oh God, would you would you let me read the same code book? Would you let me get the same understanding? Let me know God. Amen. He made known unto Moses his way. And he, that was what made Moses so great in God. I was privileged to sit under that man. He was the man that planted this church. That's why this church has a good foundation. Yes, sir. Because it was a right foundation yes, from a man that was truly called of God. Yes. On now to his reward, like many of the men of God. Are. But some of those men were right with God. Amen, brother. Some of them had divine revelation from God. Yes, sir. Some of them knew his ways, not just his acts, but they knew his ways. So when we look at the book of, uh, of, of uh, 
I, I wanted to show you that in the 34th chapter there um, on Moses. Um, I'll finish uh, chapter 34, verse 9. And Joshua, uh, uh, and Joshua the son of Nun, verse 9, uh, Deuteronomy 34, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hand upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, when the Lord, whom the Lord knew face to face. Face to face. And all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all of Israel all the great wonders that Moses showed the great authority that he showed um, Deuteronomy means second law I gave you that, not repeating, not repeating the Ten Commandments over again, but explaining the way that Moses received the Word of God. There were situations and problems in Israel that wasn't covered by the law. Um, you couldn't find it in the Ten Commandments. Moses dealt with situations that was outside of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not I commit adultery uh, because human beings don't stay within the framework of just ten violations of the Word of God. Uh, there's individual circumstances in a church, in the church, that uh, it may not deal directly with one of the commandments, but it deals with the work of flesh that enters our carnal nature and then the serpent takes control. And that specific case, uh, Moses had to deal with, and we have to deal with, and in the Word of God, totally. That's why you have to have both uh, wings. You have to have both the law of uh, Moses and grace, the grace covenant, dealing with every situation because there's not just ten specific things that man violates or man does uh, that God has to deal with in the church. In fact, much of the order of God, divine order in the church, it isn't just implicated uh, plainly in the Ten Commandments. Uh, the divine order that governs the church has to come from interpretation of the laws of God. That's why Moses, in his last years, if, I'll give you an example of that, in um, the 28th chapter from Let's, let's say from the, uh, the 27th, uh, I get over here, and uh, uh, 20, 20, uh, let's say just for an example, um, that if Moses began to teach uh, Israel very, very technically in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. <laughs> and um, he, he begins to deal Specifically, well, he does in the 27th chapter, 2, uh, verse 1, And Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day. Now, that was, that was outside of the Ten Commandments. That was, that was explaining the law of God outside of just, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And it shall be on the day when you shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, that thou shalt set thee up great stones and plaster them with plaster. These are instructions that Moses is giving them when they cross over. He wasn't to be with them, but he instructed them beforehand. That reminds me of this type or this picture. Many of the things that I know I must do as a minister now to lead the church, those instructions were given me by men that are not going over the Jordan with me. They're not living in this day. They are sleeping in Christ. 
many of them are the dead in Christ. We say under the altar, Christ. Um, but they gave us instructions that they're as good today for us to understand our journey from the time of the advent of Christ and the binding of Satan and the opening of the bottomless pit, the sealing of Israel, and the beginning of the thousand years of judgment, they are as good right now as when they were taught. They were given to us, some of them 30 years ago, 20 years ago, many years ago. Moses gave this long before he died, and yet he gave them specific instructions showing that the Word of God is so precious that because the prophet dies, the Word of God that the prophet gave does not die. Amen. Because the prophet dies, the Word of God which God gave does not die. The, he bears his workmen, but his work goes on. His work goes on. And, and so he said, and it shall be on the day, well I read that, uh, verse 3, and thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law when thou art passed over, so thou mayest go in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, a land that flowed, floweth with milk and honey, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. Now, I don't believe that the land they went over into flowed literally with milk and honey. <laughs> But I do believe that honey, which is a type of sweetness, and milk, a type of nourishment, that nourishment and sweetness from God was in that land. Yes. Now that, because you can read, when they get into the land, they began to fight for every inch of ground they, they had. Right away, they came up against the walled cities, yes. Ai, and other uh, cities that they had to battle the enemy. Uh, the ites were still in the land when they crossed over into that land. Uh, but right now, the church is commanded to go over into the promised land. The promised land is the 1,000 years of reign with Christ. That's your promised land. I know we sing songs about heaven being the promised land. But as you know, those that are in the inner circle, in the great chain, in the command, in, in the 144,000, and many of them, the wise virgins, and many of them, uh, the multitude of saints, some of them will be on this earth after the first resurrection. They won't be in heaven. They're not around the throne of God. There will be a population in heaven giving hallelujah and thanks unto God, but it's the celestial angels. But the Bible specifically tells us we're going to live and reign with Christ on this earth for 1,000 years, not in heaven. Now, we'll make the journey to heaven because the Bible describes the catching away. It describes the descending of the saints. It describes the meeting in the air describes them, the company is coming together. It describes the uh, judgment of the first resurrection. But then it also shows that they will come back. The Lord cometh, the book of Jude. Behold, the Lord cometh. In it, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Where is he coming? Read the 14th chapter of Zechariah. It's coming back into Jerusalem. When you touch the Mount of Olives, feet touch the Mount of Olives, split it apart, form a great valley, and uh, the saints will march into Jerusalem. So uh, th this picture here of the lamb flowing with milk and honey, uh, the, th the earth is not going to be pretty after the battle of Armageddon. When, when, you, when the 8th and ninth and 10th chapter of Revelation is complete, the judgment, seven thunders, the seven vials, the seven uh, being, being emptied out on the earth, the judgment at one judgment after another, the great tribulation period, it's not going to be a beautiful earth. 
It's not going to be the new earth. The new earth has to become new. Yeah. Moses had to take his, that is, Joshua had to take the men in there, and it was not a land flowing with milk and honey in the literal sense, but it was flowing with milk and honey. It was flowing with the sweetness of their obedience unto God. Amen, and it was flowing with the nourishment of the milk. Milk and honey. There's, there's some things in the Bible, dietary things, but this is milk and honey. Uh, in Isaiah 7 and 14, isn't it? Behold, uh, no, that's not it. Um, uh, butter and honey. Is that Isaiah 9? I'm getting my... Uh, butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to choose the good. Or is that Isaiah 14? I'm not satisfied with like that. I know. Uh, I don't use these scriptures sometimes, and I have to go back and refresh them in my mind. Uh, but in Isaiah, what is it? 7:15. Yeah. All right. Butter and honey shall he eat. That's after uh, he's brought forth the virgin conceived. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the good and uh, uh, the evil and choose the good. Now, you know that's not literal. Christ did not just eat butter and honey. He would have been a rather large man if that would have been his diet. And Isaiah 53 doesn't describe him as that. Uh, uh, the book of Psalms doesn't describe him as that at all. But that's a spiritual dietary notation in the scripture that we're to get lessons from, we're to get examples from, just like the milk and the honey, showing that Christ, uh, milk and honey, then butter and honey, butter and honey. Butter is a rich substance of food and from the milk, taken uh, from the milk. The nourishment, so desire the sincere milk Peter said, but desire the sincere milk of the word. You know, that builds bone, bone structure, <coughs> builds strength. The word of God is a nourishing substance, and Christ functioned and lived on the word of his father. The word of his father was butter and honey, the sweetness of his relationship <coughs> with his father, and, and the nourishment into the bone structure of the butter. Uh, these dietary things are mentioned sort of as spiritual things, not the natural. It's not, it's, it's meaning is isn't dealing with the natural at all, but it's a spiritual implication. And uh, now that, if you don't understand that, you can ask questions on it, but that's a, just a comment, because so many times when we read the scriptures, the natural is there, but the natural is only to show the spiritual. Uh, Howbeit that which is first is natural, 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, afterward that which is spiritual. See, howbeit that which is first is natural, afterward that which is spiritual. There was a natural man, Adam, but there was a spiritual man, Christ, the last Adam. The first Adam was natural. The last Adam was spiritual. <laughs> So that it was not, the first was natural. Um, then, and in this uh, 27th chapter, go we'll just a little bit further. Uh, Therefore it shall be, when you, verse 4, going over Jordan, that you shall set up these stones, which I command you, this day I believe those stones were statues of God's law, in Mount Ebal, and thou shalt plaster them with plaster, and, thou shalt, and there shalt thou build up an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones, that uh, thou shalt not lift up any iron to upon them. In other words, you will not uh, chip or try to compromise uh, that which you build up as an altar unto God. Everything in the scriptures has meaning. Every word, every sentence has a meaning. Uh, he didn't want them to lift up a stone, a, a, a tool of iron. Uh, he doesn't want us to lift up uh, the iron to chip away at the stones which is set up to God, which we're commanded to set up stones. 
Uh, you can use that many ways. We use people, the saints of God, as lively stones. We use Christ as the stone which the builders rejected. Um, we, iron in the scriptures, iron sharpeneth iron. Iron is used as the word of God. Um, and and uh, remember, in, is it uh, Kings, Second Kings, where uh, the, uh, they had the axe, and they were hewing with the axe, and the head fell off uh, and, and in the water, and they had to have a miracle from the prophet uh, to cause the iron to swim. Well, that's a picture of the Word of God. Uh, you know, the handle that man uses uh, is just what God gives him the gift of his gift. But with his gift has to be the Word of God. The Word of God is the iron. And uh, so he didn't want the, he didn't want them to take uh, false words and false teaching and rest the scriptures and and turn aside Amen. from the commandments that Moses said you'll set up and you'll plaster with plaster and you'll build up these stones and you'll take it up to the mountain and build it up. Uh, this was an exact commandment for how they, they they were to live, how they were to behave themselves when they got into the land of promise. I believe God is so wonderful that everything he says or does, uh, if you'll study it enough, you'll see the picture in it. Just don't hurry through it, don't wish it out, but study it and pray and ask God to talk to your mind about it. Sister Ginger. What is the plaster? Plaster was that which they smoothed over with and, and made it harmonious. Plaster brought the, the surface together um, uh, that's the that's the love of God. Uh, whatever God does has to be plastered with plaster. God plasters the church with His love. Otherwise, there could be no oneness in the church. There could be no one body, one spirit. Fills all the cracks, all the seams. A charity, charity is plaster. That's the plaster of the New Testament. Is charity. The only way you can have one spirit in an assembly, because you'll never have it in your spirit. There isn't a person in the church that will not be critical at some moment if you'll let your carnal mind rule you. If you'll let your natural man rule you, you'll find something to separate from your sister or your brother over. And the children of God have not used enough plaster in the last days. They need more charity, charity of, of beareth all things, hopeth all things, believeth all things. Charity suffereth long. Charity covered the multitude of sins. Charity covered the multitude of sins. See, in other words, it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that charity just tried to say there was no sin. It, it just doesn't let that be open for the vultures and all the fowls of the air to come and feed upon in the church. David said, when Saul was killed, what did he say? When Saul was killed, and that man brought him the news and thought he'd get a reward from David, he got a reward all right. Yeah. Uh, David said, take his head. Uh, take his head, he thinks he's rejoicing over Saul. Oh, I'll get a reward from David. I, I outrun everybody else. I come to tell him that Saul is done for. He's over with. But David didn't take it that way. He said, you tell it not in Gath, or publish it in Ascalon, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised try it. Uh, you know, uh, God's people ought to be careful how they expose what's going on among them. They can't hardly wait to tell not only their sister and brother, they tell their neighbors sometimes. It gets out in neighborhoods, what's happening in the church. Because a dear child of God is over there telling somebody, uh, you know, this took place in the church. Their children know about it. Their, their, their kinfolks know about it. Uh, but we ought to take lessons from those scriptures and, uh, and, and put, put plaster over the, the stones and, and let God raise up a monument uh, to the altar of God. A, a wonderful picture, man. A wonderful picture. Parents have 
for lunch and baked saints for dinner. Their children will have nothing to do with the church. Yeah, he said you can't have those uh, different things. He said, uh, you know, fried, stewed, and baked saints all day long in a home, and and the children hear it, and people listen uh, to it. And he used to say also, he said, um, somebody asked him one time, Brother Jolly, uh, he said, to, and Brother Jolly was kind of a firm man, very firm, said, Brother Jolly, uh, can we bake a pie and take it over to this person that's been gossiping about everybody in the church? Uh, and he said, no, don't bake a pie. Go out and get a mud pie and put vinegar and onions in it and take it over to them, he said, because that's what they need. He said, that's what their spirit is showing forth right now. Uh, they're slaying God's people. They're slandering God's people. Now, I don't know that I would advise anybody to do that, but uh, Brother Jolly did. Uh, that was just his way, and he was a very firm man in those things. He said, take a uh, pie and, and uh, take it over and show them uh, that this is their spirit. Uh, well, I don't know that they ever did that, anybody, but uh, anyway, it was quite a, quite a departure from uh, his, his nature. Uh, he could be a kind man also and a very compassionate man. All right, now the 27th and 28th chapter and the 29th chapter uh, all are specific instructions of Moses uh, to Israel. Um, and and he, he shows them that they will suffer destruction if they disobey, if they rebel. And my goodness, uh, if you read it in detail, I don't know uh, if you have or not, uh, but he shows them that they will be cursed and they won't be the head, they'll be the tail. Uh, let me read you verse 15 of chapter uh, 28 and some of the curses of disobedience. He said, verse 15, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and all his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thine kind, uh, and, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt be thou when thou comest in, and cursed shalt be thou when thou goest out. My God, my God, that was, that was a curse upon Israel, wasn't it? And Moses warned them, he said, you'll be cursed. You'll be cursed if you do this. And, and, and then he also showed them uh, the blessings of the Lord, if they would um, bless him and, and, and uh, the, about curse. So the book of Deuteronomy is a very interesting book in that it specifically prepares people to go over into the promised land. I believe that we now should have the second law. That is the second word of God dispensation. <coughs> the time when the word of God, the second law, is now being taught. <coughs> We're trying to get the final instructions so we can go into the promised land, so we can rule with Christ, so we can live and not die, so we can inherit the first resurrection. That means, where will I get that? God has never let his people be without a shepherd and shepherds. Amen. God will never let you hunger and not feed you. God will never let you be starving and needing food and drink and not lead you to it. Absolutely provide it. Give it. He has in every dispensation. <clears throat> From the beginning till now, he has. Any questions on what I've set up in this time? We're getting near time with the park. Gotcha. What is the 
Would that second law at least be related to uh, 1 John 3 uh, when, it, when it talks about we know we are of God because we love one another and you know, charity and love has, has been a theme uh, or a secondary theme tonight and I'm just wondering if or, or if there's much more to it <coughs> like, like the uh, exposition of Moses and detail of uh, his understanding. I, I think that Sister Ginger, you're hitting the nail right on the head. I believe that our second law or the, the dispensation of the latter reign, the second advent of Christ, is bound up in these epistles. Uh, we know Deuteronomy as history. I teach Deuteronomy as history tonight. Mm -hmm. That which has been. Even though I dealt in types and shadows and tried to use those pictures back there. But that is history. And we only look at it as history. As a natural nation, Israel. Now we're all together different. We're a spiritual nation. We're a holy uh, priesthood. We're, we're a righteous nation, and and we're to be a peculiar people, a chosen uh, people of God, and a chosen generation. And our instructions are coming from 